Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, let me go through a little bit of the protocol. Uh, Tansi Michael, uh, the president of KSI, who is now the, 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 the brain and the facts behind this Asia Economic uh, and Entrepreneurship Summit and uh, His Excellency Andrew Weir, uh, Pacific Basin Economic Council Chairman. And of course, uh, although we don't have the minister, the senior minister from Malaysia, that was Sri Fadila Yusuf, I'll have to, as a protocol process, address him. And uh, my esteemed panel of people for this first session, First of all, I'm very glad that uh, I'm able to moderate this, not to chair, but to moderate this particular session, a very important, uh, important one. And it has been, in a way, uh, well kick-started by Tansri Michael's opening remarks and then uh, Andrew Weir's uh, uh, remarks at the beginning and uh, excellently supported by the minister, the senior minister on the aspects, in particular, what has been taking place in Malaysia. And this is actually a sort of an indication as to what probably is happening elsewhere, not necessarily in Asia alone. As you know, right now, the US is facing this infrastructure problem uh, in its own political dimensions and uh, a sort of a cliffhanger is there, uh, whether the economy is going to, the financial system is going to shut down and so on. Let me come back to this uh, Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit and Asia Economic and Investment Outlook in order to look at what is the future of this. And Asia is a very, very wide uh, uh, geographical uh, configuration, political diversities, and also demographic and the other challenges. And yet we look at it as if it is a sort of uh, homogeneous kind of a thing. Uh, it may not be true, but nevertheless, we have to address this as a region among the five or six continents. Now, we have always been told the 21st century is the century of Asia. Uh, this is a historical perspective. If you look at the 19th century as something that we have with Britain imperial century and the 20th century is the century of the US, the United States of America. And uh, therefore the 21st century is the century of Asia. Of course, we are Asians and we are very proud to see that we have a role to play in the global sea. Uh, I think uh, uh, Asian Development Bank somewhere back in 2011 uh, sort of a projected that the, we are in right in the middle of a historic transformation. And if it follows to, uh, if it continues to follow the trajectory, then by 2050, its per capita income could rise sixfold, uh, whether it is in pure GDP terms or PPP, the uh, purchasing power parity, to reach the European level. Uh, is yet a sort of a goal that is going to be set for uh, one of the challenges. Now, if we look at the IMF statistics, it shows that uh, the, the progress has been to some extent there, and uh, we find that the role of uh, Asian countries in the top ranking 10 economies of the world, and we have seen uh, China overtaking slowly into a number two slot, and uh, everybody is projecting that soon, whatever 2030 or uh, much later, China may take on the number one position. And not to forget about India, India is also coming. And of course, 
Japan, who has been occupying the number two position, will continue to play a very important role. And other economies, uns not suspected earlier, for example, Indonesia, is now projected to play with its 280 million population and so on. So ASEAN is coming into a limelight in that sense. And the role of the ASEAN within the Asia and its ability to take on challenges with China or with Europe or with the US is very, very interesting. And of course, we have been listening to some of the speeches earlier and we look at the technological innovations. We have seen the trade war. The trade war is basically a war that is against Asia, I would say, although it is focused on, on China, but we cannot ignore the fact that China is part of Asia. And now you find the technological war is now coming in very strongly. And these are frontiers for the challenges uh, that is going to be ahead of us. And of course, now not only trade war, but you look at the technology war, and then the real physical war also is looming with uh, nuclear submarines in the region. And Andrew will have to be looking at it from the point of view of the Pacific Basin and whether the Pacific uh, Basin is going to be the focus of a nuclear, although this non-proliferation of the nuclear, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, military, militarized nuclear region is going to be. So that is going to be a lot of challenges. And all these challenges will have to address the investment outlook that we are looking at. So that as the, 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 the basis, and also the Asian population, the demographic distribution is now looking at this millennial, uh, the sort of a young people who are coming in into the population. And then uh, you have got the middle class. And in Malaysia, we have got this, we call it the bottom 40, the middle 40, and the top 20. And then the metropolitan and mobile enable in the important criteria shaping the new Asia century. But this is something that we didn't, we, we thought that it would happen before the COVID pandemic. But the COVID pandemic has now come into play and what it is going to be the post COVID or the new normal and so on. That being my overall opening remarks for this. And I'm very, very happy that uh, we have an excellent panel who will discuss. Uh, just, I think Zaim has already introduced the speakers. So let me not uh, go on their profile or the CVs, but repeat the names, Andrew, of course, uh, Andrew Weir, Pacific Basin Economic Council Chairman, and a very important partner in this uh, summit. And uh, Manu Baskaran is a very senior uh, columnist and also a commentator. Uh, he's with us. Go Wanda, Dr. Go Wanda, Executive Vice President, China Development Institute, another eminent person, and looking at the Chinese perspective and their role in the world and the role in ASEAN and in Asia. And our, our own Shan Shaid, Chief Economist of uh, Joy IQI Holding, and Dr. Mia, Advisor at Large of the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network. And of course, she has been working formerly in UNSCAP, with which I had some relationship some time back, and Dr. Giant Manon, visiting senior fellow, but previously with ADB and so on. So I will not uh, disturb the order in which the organizers have laid out uh, for your presentation. Just like to seek your kind indulgence that each person would uh, address about eight minutes or so of your timing to do your presentation, whether it is going to be a shared screen with your points or you're going to speak off the cuff. And then we conclude 
uh, with that. And then it goes into an interactive session among yourself and among the participants who are following. We have roughly about 130 or 40 over people who are following this uh, summit. And maybe it will come online with some questions. I will try to filter those questions so that uh, it will be relevant to the discussions and will be pointing it. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce, uh, to invite uh, Mr. Andrew Weir, Chairman of the Pacific Economic Basin Council to address us. Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Datuk Seri Mohammed. Thank you so much. And it is wonderful to be here. Uh, again today, and uh, all uh, best wishes to my friends at Economic Club of, uh, of Kuala Lumpur. Please excuse me, I notice my camera has been moving a bit. Please forgive me. Uh, is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Well, I think- Very the... good, very good. Very good. good, good. I think the topics um, uh, Zaim sets out and uh, Michael in his introduction ran through are, are absolutely ideal. Just a bit of background, I, I've been in Asia I've just had my 30th anniversary in Asia, uh, based in Hong Kong, but worked extensively in the region. And uh, my day job, I run KPMG in Hong Kong, vice chairman uh, in China, but globally, I chair the asset management part of KPMG, which is one of our largest sectors. And colleagues on the call may be interested. Why I raise this is because these are the big global self sovereign wealth funds, the big private equity funds, the big investment funds, and so I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to see what they're thinking. And in that context, um, what I'd just like to do is to first endorse uh, what Mohammed said about this still being Asia's century. And the big financial institutions globally are still allocating significant capital to Asia. I spend a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Qatar, Saudi, and others, the direction of travel and the glide path of investment is definitely eastward. And why is that? I think you still got these enormous trends which you've touched on. Emerging middle class, raising the bottom 40% as well. Super connectivity and the opportunity of a rising China and rising India and a very strong trading block in ASEAN. The big picture potential, and then with the economic growth and hard work and good quality public finances in most economies. A consumer led um, economic growth story driven by a significant infrastructure spending is a very, very attractive proposition. And so for me, I have no regrets having been here for 30 years. It is Asia century. But to succeed, one has to be agile. And as I said earlier, there'll be winners and losers. The biggest risk we run is not realizing what's changing around us. But I think Mohammed's summary at the beginning shows a very good understanding uh, of points which are, which are relevant to consideration. So is it a new normal? It's very fashionable to say new normal. My answer would be yes and no. No, because certain universal truths still prevail competitiveness, the importance of governance, the importance of a sense of purpose and social obligation. These universal truths are the same. But it's new because there's significant disruption. There's significant disruption to global supply chains. There's significant disruption, as Mohammed said, to the geopolitical post-Second World War international trading system. There's disruption to it. And there's this dis disruption as a result, no doubt, of COVID. There's social disruption in that quantitative easing globally has given rise to excessive liquidity, which enables the richer part of society to invest and have fairly low risk uh, on investment, but a significant part of society who can't access assets because they can't access the liquidity. So there's a lot of moving parts, but is there a new normal? Yes, there's a big change. COVID has acted as a catalyst on three big things. The first one is an absolute transformation of, by digital. I would treat this as being the same as an industrial revolution. It's not just now 
digital helping us to do what we used to do. It is defining what an organization or a country wants to do, and then how does digital enable us to get there? It's very different. It's a revolution and transformation. And I'm based in China. This move from being online to truly digital is an industrial revolution of huge proportions. The second big theme, which uh, is so important to you, Normal, and gives opportunities and threats, is I think COVID has been a catalyst in a quantum leap forward on the importance of sustainability. It's gone from being supply side, lobby led into government top down, corporate board strategy level top down, and an alliance of regulators across jurisdictions and different regulators within a jurisdiction are aligned. And there's a couple of massive themes developing. The first is that climate change, COVID, COVID-26, sorry, forgive me, COP26, is the other massive transformation like digital of an industrial revolution scale. The impact of commitment to zero carbon for companies and countries is grossly misunderstood and misunderrepresented in the broader business community. The scale of transformation needed is incredible. So we have these two, I said, akin to industrial revolutions in, in respect to digital transformation and in terms of climate change. And climate change in many ways will now be seen as a financial risk, which brings the whole international financial community and financial institutions into play. But a third big thing which has emerged from uh, COVID is this definition of purpose. What are we here for? What is a government here for? What's an NGO here for? What's a company here for? What are we trying to achieve? And what I always say is history will not be kind on us. History will not look at the restrictions and difficulties we had at this time. It will look at how we behaved and how we positioned our organizations and ourselves. And how do we take into account what the world is gonna look like in three or five years and know that we will be judged with reference to what we did in this difficult time. So how we do things, values and governance are super important. So where's the opportunities? I think Mohammed gave a great overview. I'm hugely bullish about ASEAN, 690 million people, half of whom are under the age of 30. The linkages with China, the free trade agreements, RCEP, TTP. And for me, based where I am in Hong Kong, it's how it all links together. The smart businesses are seeing the linkage of the Greater Bay Area Initiative, which is a top-down national initiative integrating Southern China and Hong Kong, into Belt and Road, into ASEAN, and into other regional economies, linking with national policies, such as um, uh, the new the Eastern Economic Corridor in Thailand, for example, or the big new infrastructure programs in Vietnam. The linkages of these gives huge opportunity. And this is a way of harnessing in a positive way, the incredible economic investment power of China and also India. So regional collaboration, national plans, science parks, industrial parks in national economies, the linkage of these into these regional opportunities is very important. A couple of sectors. So basically free trade. Trade is the answer to so many of these things. So what sectors do I see great opportunity in? I was delighted to listen about the Malaysian infrastructure plans. What a story. Infrastructure, logistics, even commercial real estate, in my view, is a one-way bet. I deal with major global sovereign wealth funds. They're all looking for logistics platforms. The private equity funds are all looking for logistic platforms. Industrial Industrial logistics support for e-commerce fulfillment in national economies is a burgeoning area. But the new approach to supply chains gives huge opportunities. What do I mean by that? I think we have to accept the post-war Bretton Woods international trading system is changing. And that globalization 
is being restricted. That gives risk and opportunity. But for this part of the world, Mohammed, I think it gives great opportunity, but one needs to be agile. The opportunity is how does one mitigate the risk in the US, China, China global supply chains, where ASEAN, the, um, the Pacific base has played a major part? How does one mitigate it? How does one provide an alternative? Uh, an alternative um, supply chain. So in my part of the world, it's China plus one is a big philosophy. The use of manufacturing opportunities in China. Now the question is, we want to remain in China, but should we have another manufacturing capacity in Malaysia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Cambodia? So a fresh look to supply chain and the opportunity it brings, I think is very, very important. And with that becomes a difference in the view of supply chain. Supply chain used to be thought of as simply third parties. Now, going back to my point on purpose and governance, these days, people think of supply chains as third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties. In other words, who one does business with and who the people we do business with do business with, the chain is much more important than before. And the understanding of how our businesses are doing their business with others and how others do their business is a major, major opportunity in this part of the world. It's an opportunity for forces of good relating to governance and sustainability and climate to be brought to bear. In all of this, the theme is entrepreneurship. The biggest challenge we have is to ensure in a slightly depressed global relationship world, that in Pacific Basin, entrepreneurs in each market have networks in order to link together. There's a lot of very, very good initiatives. And I just think the opportunity remains very, very great, but to secure it requires a new level of collaboration. Just a couple of final points. New economy. Um, George, my deputy chairman at PBEC, is, is chairman of the, um, the science park here, sorry, the cyber, cyber port here. Digital connectivity. Yes, there are challenges on data, but digital connectivity across Pacific Basin gives huge, huge opportunities. And with that, the startup communities. How can we have MOUs between different countries, different entrepreneurship urban organizations to help us on our way? So maybe I just leave it there, uh, Mohammed, to give food for thought. But yes, we need an exit strategy on COVID. But let's put that to one side, we will find our way. For the next 25, 30 years, do I believe as a, as a British person based in Asia for 30 years and passionate about Asia, that Asia, it is Asia's century, and the opportunities at Asia are the best in the world. I totally believe in that still. And I believe that the big global investment funds and big global financial institutions believe the same and take a strong positive view uh, about the Asia economic story. But the key to all of us is we're not complacent. We realize we have to change. We see where the risks are and we're super agile and Going back to the six C's me and Michael were talking about, we follow through on those. So maybe I'll pass back to you, Mohammed, but I, I hope you can see I'm very, very bullish about the opportunities. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think uh, you hit the nail uh, on the top. <laughs> I think you have driven home <laughs> the fact that I think it is a very important and, and, and the conclusion that you have reached. Uh, there is abundant finances available globally, not only asset management funds or Euro or elsewhere. And then the flow has been there, but you are seeing that in the current situation and post-COVID era, if nations and countries and regional uh, economies come together, there would be a greater. Thank you very much for your very patient.
and analysis. I will not venture to uh, say anything uh, on that. Uh, so we go on to speak Manu time. I think uh, Manu writes quite a bit uh, in the local media and also in the current Chief Executive Officer of Sentinel Asia Advisors Private Limited to present his views on this topic. Manu? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh... Dr. Sri Mohammed, uh, and uh, I would first like to thank the uh, organizers and Tan Sri Michael in particular for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, panel of very distinguished uh, observers and commentators. Um, in the eight minutes I have, I'd like to uh, make um, two sets of points, and I'd like to continue on the uh, very positive tone taken by Andrew, which I support. The first um, argument I want to make is to present a fairly upbeat view of the global economic uh, context in which this region will operate. Secondly, I would like to also uh, make an argument for why I think Southeast Asia can, under certain circumstances, uh, do very well. In fact, uh, it could, I believe, regain its uh, position that it had once in the early 1990s as one of the preeminent sources for investment uh, flows in the world. So let me first start by looking at the post-COVID uh, world and how it's likely to be shaped. And let me say at the outset that I am not downplaying the um, uh, concerns and the risks that many very learned observers have outlined. Uh, you know, the talk about secular stagnation and all these issues. Yes, it is true that there are geopolitical risks that could lead to economic challenges like bifurcation and protectionism. We could see more inward looking policies in many countries because of the rising populism. Um, there could be a big payback to the ultra easy monetary conditions that we have seen in the last 10 years. And there could be financial stresses. And um, <clears throat> rounding that off, of course, is the whole challenge of climate change, which is still not fully understood. So I'm not downplaying these risks, but I do want to say that I believe that with the right measures taken by both governments, and by the bottom-up uh, group of companies and NGOs and civil society, these issues, I believe, can be managed. <clears throat> Let me just briefly outline why I think these risks can be contained. First, if you look at the geopolitical side, yes, there's a lot of bad news. The, the new alliance that the US has just announced has added to concerns about uh, the future. But I do believe also that the <clears throat> large powers understand that they have to do what is necessary to avoid the extreme risks. And just like the US and Russia did during their Cold War, after a period of nudging and pushing and shoving, I think you'll see that China and the US will settle into a new equilibrium where it may be uncomfortable, there may be frequent periods of tension and friction, but the extreme scenarios can be avoided. <clears throat> Secondly, in terms of globalization and the threats to it, it, and it really um, makes me feel encouraged to see that there continue to be proponents of globalization that are working very hard to try and maintain some degree of momentum in economic partnership agreements. That's why we have RCEP. That's why we have CPTPP, which, by the way, has taken on added momentum just in the last week with a flurry of countries now uh, applying to join, which would be very good news for all of us. Um, thirdly, in terms of financial risks, which I think are very real, um, I also believe that <coughs> central banks and financial supervisation, uh, supervisory agencies have learned uh, to deal with uh, many of these risks and they have developed uh, tools to uh, anticipate these risks and to contain them when the risks do materialize. So the risks, I think, are there. We don't discount them, but I think with good sense, they can be managed. Now, what will drive the economies? I would want to make a strong argument for us not to underestimate the multiple revolutions in technology that are, I think, going to be immensely constructive for world economic growth. And it is not just the Infocom area. We all know the exciting possibilities raised by you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, big data, the Internet of Things, and all these things. But in addition to that, we have revolutions in renewable energy. We've had 
wind and solar are now becoming commercially realizable, hydrogen is on the way. We have uh, groundbreaking changes in material sciences, new composite materials, which make all kinds of things possible. We have uh, further advances in biomedical areas. Why do you think that we were able to devise a vaccine for COVID-19 so rapidly? Never before has that happened. The, and the list goes on, agrotech, fintech, and so on. These revolutions are going to create immense business opportunities that will attract big investments and that will lead to high growth. <clears throat> and as we move on in the world economy, the weight of the faster growing large emerging economies will increase. And just as a matter of arithmetic, uh, as the weight of faster growing economies in the overall scheme of things increases, the average rate of growth can increase. Right? So the overall context is not that bad. There are downsides, it can be managed. The upsides, I think, may be underestimated by many. Now, what about Southeast Asia? <clears throat> I think uh, Southeast Asia is in a good place right now. Yes, COVID has not been a great experience and it has exposed some flaws, which I will talk about later. But let us not forget that the longer term trends remain in our favor. There is a reconfiguration of production supply chains. I think that is largely going to benefit countries in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> and I can tell you, even during the period of COVID, we have seen the foreign direct investment flows coming in uh, that, uh, that support that view. Secondly, we have seen over the last few years, a whole series of supply side reforms um, <clears throat> in many countries in ASEAN. And that will improve further ASEAN's attractiveness to foreign direct investment. Uh, we have seen changes and improvements, the <clears throat> ease of doing business, a lot of red tape that has been cut. In Indonesia, we've seen, I think, potentially uh, very game-changing labor market reforms. Um, <clears throat> These things, I think, will contribute to um, uh, much more investment and therefore growth. We're also seeing a big surge in infrastructure spending. It has slowed a bit in the last 12, 15 months because of COVID, but there are now signs that that is beginning to pick up again. That will be another engine of growth. And <clears throat> finally, as um, Andrew pointed out, there are many reasons to expect growing synergies from more economic integration uh, RCEP has, uh, is on the way to being fully ratified. CPTPP has been fully ratified, but you also have other um, <clears throat> integration programs like the Greater Mekong subregion, the northern part of ASEAN, which I would argue have been extremely successful. So let me then look at what could go wrong. And very quickly, since I'm running out of time, I think political risk is clearly a concern. Uh, the tragic events in Myanmar, um, <clears throat> put the wrong kind of spotlight on ASEAN, um, and there are domestic political risks as well. Secondly, I think COVID has exposed some weaknesses in state capacity, uh, the way we manage healthcare, the way we devise um, and implement um, programs to support the economy, the, the speed with which uh, fiscal programs can be dispersed. These things have been uh, shown to have weaknesses which we need to tackle. And I think if we can tackle these issues, then I think the region will be in a good shape and we will see uh, foreign direct investment coming back to ASEAN. ASEAN's economic growth, I believe, will accelerate post-COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Uh, that's good. I think uh, you are able to echo what Andrew has said on the global perspective. And I agree that generally Asia focus will not go away. There are no contrarian views, but on the Southeast Asia and the Southeast Asia wider, the ASEAN perspective. And uh, what you mentioned about the regional integration, and I suppose the region particularly ASEAN has taken the right steps and then with other countries beyond ASEAN have formed this RCEP and then of course the TPP and the CPP are matrices that bring the advantages to the region 
to embark on. So ultimately, it is not the regional integration that is going to push the agenda. It, is, it provides a framework, but national economies themselves will have to come and go back to the earlier issue and the other infrastructure, uh, including the soft side of the infrastructure that will propel each country's economy and integrate. Thank you Manu, for your excellent presentation. And now we move on to the next speaker. And it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's important to have the, the China perspective. I'm sure he's not going to dwell solely on China, but trying to integrate and see how China takes a position globally as well as within Asia. Dr. Go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, yes, in terms of Asia economic and investment outlook, I would like to focus on Chinese economy based on my research background. Uh, what factors will drive China economy in the short run, uh, even the long term, especially in this? stage of normalized uh, control and management of COVID-19 pa pa pandemic. So this year is uh, also a very special year. Uh, last year, China's economy, the GDP growth by 2.3%. That's enough, that's not so easy. As you know, last year, yeah, for China's economy uh, should be just uh, keep going on, especially the domestic market. And also in this year, the figures shows that in the first half of this year, China's GDP growth still increased by 12.7%. Yeah, first quarter more than 18%. Second quarter just uh, decreased a little bit. So yeah, the, the, the half of the year is still more than 12%. So what the driving forces for Chinese economy in this particular years, the background, I think the first one, yeah, just now, uh, both the first speaker, uh, Andrew, and the second speaker, Manu, also they talk about the uh, technological revolution, industrial revolution. Of course, I support your idea about that because in China, in the background of pandemic, yeah, the economy, uh, very important factors is the new economy, especially digital economy, is the very important chair for China's economic growth. The biggest huge threat is half year, the high tech manufacturing industry grew by more than 20%. And also the added value of new energy vehicles, industrial lobbies, integrated Merged increased by more than 200%, 70%, and 48% respectively. So we can see that the, most of the cities, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Tianjin, Chongqing, Wuhan, Chengdu, and the other cities, in last year, the industrial growth, most of them the negative growth, but in this year, most of them increase very quickly. And also the positive growth more than 10%, even some of them more than 20% because of the new economy, because of the digital economy. So online consumption and express deliver grew very quickly. 
and in this half year, the express delivery market reached 50 billion pieces, increased very quickly. The amount equal to the annual number of 2018. That means the delivery market increased very quickly because of the uh, global home economy. Yeah, of course, in China, although the, the pandemic yes, uh, still just uh, normalized, so the uh, home economy uh, inspired the, the, the delivery increase very quickly. Also, the exports and imports increase very quickly by this half year, the export increase 28% and the imports increase by 26%. And also the, the mobile phone increased, export increased 23%, automobile increased 100%, and also components of the uh, processing equipment increase 17%. So we can see the demand from the international market also increased very quickly related with the home economy. And of course, the second factor is China's domestic market. The domestic demand come from infrastructure investment. And, and also, and you mentioned about the, the the infrastructure, the supply chain, and also the energy, and also the, 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 the 5G, uh, and, and so on. So we can see the national investment in China increased by 13%, and also the consumer goods increased by 23%. So the domestic market is very important driving force for China's economy. And of course, when we look at the uh, much longer uh, year for the outlook, uh, for this year, the economy will be, the GDP growth will exceed 8% or around 8%. Because as you know, uh, this month, uh, a new challenge for China's economy recovery because of the power plant, the electricity shortage, and also the power plant, as you know, in Guangdong, in, in province, in, in Shenzhen, uh, the factories, they are just a shortage of the electricity because of the demand increased very quickly and also the production and also production increased but the shortage of the uh, power plant and also the price of the material, especially the price of the coal increased very quickly. So it's a big challenge for China. Uh, for this year, still the, the expect, expectation, the prediction were around 8%. So for a more long time, the three factors will be very important factors in the next stage of growth in Chinese economy. First one is the uh, investment in science and, and technology increase. Yeah, because in China now, both central government and the local government, they are just investing more in science, technology research and the development. So that's, uh, I think, very important factors. Secondly, about the 30, 60 goals of carbon emission peak and neutrality. Yeah, it is connected with the energy transition, connected with the, the, the industrial structure, and also, of course, uh, connected with the technology. Uh, just the uh, menu is talk about that. Third one is the consumer demand and will be driven by the faster development cities along migration and the metropolitan areas, such as the Greater Bay Area, GBA. In, in the priority of data, they are connected to each other and 
more big, big domestic market and, and the more investment in the infrastructure. Yeah, of course, uh, there's a lot of challenges for China's economy, such as the Sino-US, is China-US relationship, and also the, the uh, globalization. Of course, I agree with the speakers. They are just uh, globalization will keep going on, but still have a lot of challenges in there. And also China now applied to join the CPTPP and also the RC. What, 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 what will going on about, about the CPTPP and what will be in the RCEP? What's the, the, the implementation and also what's the impacts on China's economy? And now we are talking a lot about the, the, the future factors about that. So that's my presentation, my point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Go. I think uh, you, as expected, have uh, well focused on the China uh, scenario. And uh, I think the world is watching uh, because from not only what you have stated on the performance of the economy, but on the containment of the COVID uh, as well as the post COVID. I think China is also having the sort of a COVID problems, but you already migrated into a post COVID era while containing it and see how best you can go. So it is an exceptional view. I think uh, we will have a little bit more discussion as to what the political platform under which these are taking place and then the economic understanding on which you have progressed. Thank you very much, Dr. Go. I just have to sort of uh, not warn, uh, caution the other remaining three speakers. I'm afraid that uh, we are running into a little bit of time constraint and we need a little bit of uh, time for questions uh, from the floor or from interactions among the panelists. So with that uh, little uh, suggestions, I would like to ask Shan Said now to take the floor. Shan? Thank you, uh, Dr. Sir Iqbal. Bismillah rahman rahim Good morning and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Thank you, Tansri Michael Yo. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, KSI, one of the top uh, think tanks in Asia Pacific for having me on this important forum. Let me start off by saying that the alchemy of financial markets have changed dramatically in the last 15 years. Uh, markets are in a mood. And we now have from QE, we have moved to MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. And that is making a huge impact. Uh, can you please bring the slide? In November, 2020, we shared in a newsletter that we are going back to the same era of 1970, that is stagflation. And now everybody is talking about stagflation. What is stagflation? When you have high inflation, lower growth and high unemployment. And we have seen uh, because of this COVID, 100 to 300 million people have gone into uh, poverty levels. 20 million to 30 million people have lost their jobs globally. So what we are in, we are in for a great economic fragility. And we have already shared in our latest newsletter that is coming in October, that for 2022 and 2023, the global economic recovery will have fractured growth with a lot of financial fragilities and bazooka heading the market. But in all this, since I have been following Chinese economy in the last 20 years, China has emerged as a winner with GDP touching almost $60 trillion. And China has used dual circulation strategy that was reported in Economist magazine last August to spur growth and to support their local businesses. So what investors are doing when you have stagflation? The latest issue of Economist magazine two weeks back shared the same thing what we have been uh, sharing in the market in various press and media outlets. There are two asset classes where sophisticated and smart investors have taken the position. One is real estate and the other is commodities. And I can talk about my company, despite COVID, despite economic fragilities, global economic slowing down, Malaysia, ASEAN, we have touched 1.5 billion ringgit of sale. That is roughly 6.2 billion ringgit of 
uh, uh, sales this year. In 2020, our sale was 5.5 billion. In 2019, our sale was 3.3 billion. So I think we uh, uh, have managed uh, to overcome this COVID. We have used technology. We have been very aggressive in the market and we have been one of the top brokerage houses in Malaysia. Second, we have seen in the last one month that everybody's talking about natural gas, long queues in London. Uh, Europe is having a severe issue of natural gas. Europe gets 50% of natural gas from Russia. Natural gas is up 26%, oil is up 55%, and higher oil prices will bolster uh, inflation outlook for the next two years. So what we have been sharing in the market is quite spot on, that history is repeating after 51, 52 years, and we are in this era of stagflation. So where are the investment opportunities? Number one that I've shared is real estate. Number two is LNG and oil, because energy will remain. You need energy to spur growth. And China has been quite smart. They have signed contracts one year ahead, you know, to secure uh, energy for the economy to boost. As Dr. Go rightly pointed out, H1, the GDP uh, grew immensely by 12.7%, which uh, clearly satisfies China's position of using dual circulation strategy. E-commerce, big thing in ASEAN. E-commerce will touch $3 trillion in China by 2024. And in Malaysia, we have seen, we have witnessed in the last two years, many players have come into e-commerce industry and they are making good money. And the key is to align yourself uh, with key players in the global economy, especially in technology landscape. In 1973, Henry Kissinger said that I've shared with Estro Wani as well in my latest uh, comment. In 1973, Henry Kissinger said, whoever takes control of money and oil will rule the global economy. After 48 years, this mantra has changed. Whoever takes control of ports, commodities, technology will rule the global economy. And China is in the forefront. Whether it's EV, whether it's AI, China is moving ahead. Infrastructure. I was very fortunate enough that I attended the annual meeting of World Bank and IMF in 2017. And the first topic was Belt and Road. And China is leading from the front. The Belt and Road total valuation of projects right now is $4.5 trillion, which is quite massive. Taking into current account, many economies are still struggling. You are still struggling to pass the $3.5 trillion of infrastructure bill. Now let's come to the risk. We have already shared uh, in media since May that four risk and one more risk is coming to the market. One is systematic risk. Central banks raising interest rates and inflation. The second risk, sovereign debt risk, $16.3 trillion of bonds, sovereign bonds, uh, uh, global bonds are trading in negative. It doesn't make sense. The third is a liquidity risk. From 2019, September to 2020, Fed injected $7 trillion in the repo market, the money market. And just recently in June and July, Fed injected $1.5 trillion in the reverse repo market. So clearly there is a, a liquidity risk that is coming into the market. The fourth is the valuation risk. We have all seen equity markets touching all time high. US is the biggest with $99 trillion of equity valuation. But I think once the market takes a bedlam and pandemonium, these equity valuations will come down by 20 to 30%. The last, as Dr. Suri rightly mentioned at the start, geopolitical risk. The waters of South China Sea are getting uh, hotter and any misadventure from any misplay can be quite disastrous. It could jeopardize the recovery of a global economy. So I think these are some of the risks and I am living in uh, Malaysia for the last 10 years all the speakers have mentioned, it's an Asian-centric uh, uh, era. In, 1920, in, in, in the 19th century, everybody was moving to London. In 2020, in the 20th century, everybody was moving uh, to New York. Now everybody is moving to Shanghai. So people want to live in Shanghai, uh, KL, Bangkok, Singapore, Hong Kong, Jakarta. These are some of the cities that all the big players, uh, they, uh, they want to live in. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, as uh, usual, your macro analytic uh, approach is always quite interesting and you are bringing in uh, a sort of a, um, a warning on possibility of other economic factors 
or theoretical understanding of stagflation and so on. But in, 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 a, in a way, you are sort of uh, echoing some of the points raised by Dr. Go on the Chinese economy and see how they have mobilized themselves. Uh, I think we will reserve some comments towards the end. And thank you very much, Sean. And then we move on to, uh, I should have, if I had the freedom, ask the lady to be the first speaker. Uh, Dr. Mia, uh, sorry, <laughs> I have to bring you in the order. And it is always interesting to have another speaker uh, without gender bias to, and you're welcome to present your views with your uh, background in UNSCAP and so on. Thank you very much. You are invited. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it is indeed my pleasure to see you uh, here, although only across the screen. Uh, we have shared many exciting moments in, uh, you know, taking the business community, uh, having better, uh, stronger voice and definitely more defined uh, role in sustainable development. So thank you very much for your support in that initiative. And uh, I, of course, uh, want to recognize uh, Tan Sri Michael for uh, you know current uh, current role in uh, ESBN and and also for inviting me repeatedly uh, to these these events that I enjoy enjoy in, enormously uh, because I have a direct opportunity to to listen to these wonderful speakers and so I'm afraid I'm not going to add much value but I have prepared a few slides if you indulge me. Um, uh, uh, because uh, they will just uh, help me, I think, organize my thoughts and stay on, on top of the time limit that you have uh, given us. Uh, so as said in the beginning, uh, we were given several questions to uh, expand onto, and I would like to uh, uh, organize my thoughts and my comments along those questions by really looking at uh, what is the what is the matter or what is the state of the of the situation economic situation in asia pacific in the context of the global economy um, in this uh, context of uh, long covid and then also how does that uh, position us towards looking uh, to near uh, uh, future and medium future growth opportunities that were expanded by uh, you know wonderfully by previous speakers but i'm going to add a little bit uh, in terms of uh, some other opportunities as well and then again uh, you know just uh, talking about risks um, in uh, in and, and not mentioning many new ones, but maybe organized them in a slightly different way. So next slide, please. Um, I'm, I'm thanking organizers for helping me there. So what, uh, what we uh, fortunately uh, can rely on are some very recent uh, sort of updates of international institutions work in terms of monitoring and reporting on the performance of Asia Pacific, and uh, I think yesterday uh, World Bank has uh, launched their update on East Asia and the Pacific outlook. Uh, a few days back, it was Asia Pacific, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Asia Development Bank update. And of course, my former institution, ESCAP, has released uh, the, the survey a few months back, and the update is, is coming soon. Um, all of these, and there are many others, agree on uh, two things. One, that we have, uh, we, we, we are witnessing a strong global recovery still uh, on average uh, in 2020 and in the first two quarters of 21. However, uh, the very strong performance of Asian countries, led of course by China um, in 2020 is somehow softening. And uh, so, all of these institutions have downgraded actually the forecast for the rest of this year uh, and for the 22 slightly in terms of the expected growth for Asia uh, in, in Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands, of course. Uh, the second thing that uh, all agree is that this recovery, however strong uh, it is, is uh, multi-speed and that, the, that we have uh, really sharp differences 
in many sort of dimensions uh, in the context of that uh, recovery. Uh, of course, regional ones. And so we have many, many uh, sort of um, regions that are not doing very well. Or if you don't want to think about regions, we can talk about a group of countries like low income countries uh, and, um, and, and um, uh, least developed e economies, etc. Uh, there are differences between sectors, uh, not only between manufacturing and services, but also within those sectors. Uh, and there are differences between firms, large and, and small, of course, and, and also uh, those in, uh, that are belonging to the value chains or not, and those that are part of um, of uh, big multinationals or, or not, etc. And there are differences between communities and, and groups in the communities. Uh, I don't have to talk about uh, how women have fared in the context of pandemic or some other uh, smaller, uh, smaller groups uh, in the communities, but hopefully we can address some of this in, uh, in, in, the, in the discussion time. Uh, the, the other very uh, uh, important uh, observation in all of these reports is about uh, employment uh, through the pandemic being declining. Um, and it's, it's declining in several aspects. Uh, so what we are sh looking at is really that uh, a formal employment is declining. So the, the participation uh, in the in the workforce uh, is is declining and people are moving either in informal sectors or uh, completely abandoning um, organized organized work and then we have also uh, particularly women for example uh, leaving the the labor force uh, and and also of course younger uh, younger uh, or youth not being able to find uh, new employment. Uh, this is related, of course, with uh, also uh, uh, education. I will be looking at that in a few slides down, down uh, the presentation. But what this actually leads to is the two, two you know, uh, results. One is that we are facing increasing or deepened inequalities in terms of income, uh, but also access to opportunities. And then secondly, that the poverty, the absolute poverty is uh, increasing. Uh, so for example, one estimate uh, from this recent uh, World Bank uh, report says that in Asia Pacific itself, we will have 24 million people uh, in, um, in absolute poor uh, in 21 as uh, more than what, uh, what we have uh, 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 sort of projected in uh, 2019 before before the pandemic, and so all of this also is uh, noticeable in the in the business sector. So in the graph that you can see in the slide is actually uh, the record of uh, reported um, uh, earnings uh, by the firms, and so the, what Reuters has reported recently is that the. Uh, for the first time, actually, in last six uh, quarters, reports that we will expect a decline in uh, in the in the uh, uh, in in the re revenues uh, uh, earnings of the of the firms. Uh, the reasons for Asia slipping, just very quickly, because uh, <laughs> I have to be very economical with my with my time, is of course that uh, it is related to pandemic. Uh, the, the the initial success that we had with TTI, uh, testing, tracking, and isolation, uh, pr has proven as not a good substitute for a vaccination. And uh, of course, we are lagging behind there, and there are you know, different uh, other sectors, why uh, we have problems uh, with that, because uh, it leads into disruptions in the supply. And of course, now with um, energy and some other uh, issues, we have uh, added uh, trade cost uh, element uh, to, uh, to these. And uh, we have definitely um, uh, some um, more uh, or less optimistic news on the on the trade fr front. Next slide, please. So um, when we are trying to look at what new normal uh, we we have to face uh, uh, with prospect of uh, of of uh, exiting the the pandemic, 
there are there are certain things that 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 are sort of uh, really now uh, confirmed. Um, one is that uh, that uh, what we hoped last year uh, it did not come true. COVID is still here, and so we are talking about long COVID, not only in terms of the health consequences uh, for, uh, for, for individuals and people, but also in terms of economic, social, political uh, aspects. Um, another one is that virus uh, is not going to uh, simply uh, disappear. Uh, it's here to stay, and we have to actually see how we need to, to work with it. Uh, and uh, and then also what we have realized that what institutions, governance, and business models that we had uh, really were not up to deal with uh, with the situation that we have in this. Um, this leads us to some aspects that we can use as a as a stimulant in 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 terms of positive thinking, uh, and some bad ones. Let me start with the bad ones. It's obviously we will have slower growth prospects, um, uh, and that, as I said, will be leading to increased further increased inequalities and regress in poverty fights. Another one positive one is that we are paying more attention, and I think um, Andrew uh, had put it very nicely in terms of what is the purpose, why we are here, and what does really matter. Uh, and, and so we are, we are noticing the importance of social justice, of uh, climate change, uh, environment, uh, and this will hopefully uh, sort of come on top of these. Uh, but that requires uh, proactive policies and not uh, reactive interventionism, and requires actually reinventing different policy instruments uh, that we in Asia have been using in a completely uh, you know, different way. For example, fiscal policies will need to be used much more aggressively in terms of redistribution. Um, uh, just very quickly, uh, I know I have gotten a reminder for, uh, for, for one minute time, but uh, I, I do have another two slides that I would like to show. So next slide, please. I think it is very relevant to understand that, uh, and another click, please, forward. So just uh, to, yes, thank you. Um, so the recent uh, Pew Research uh, has uh, gone through talking to many, many individuals. And so what they have come up with is that a majority of individuals expect that the new normal will be different type of world uh, compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, but they split, not half-half, but they split um, in, in, in terms of how they see this, this change. 47% see this change being worse because they are looking from the side of greater inequalities, uh, lessening dem dem democracy, and, and of course, fake, uh, fake news. Uh, but there is a decent size, about 40% of those that look that this uh, digital economy or the uh, uh, importance of having digital access to the digital economy will actually make our life better. Uh, next slide. And so we need to help actually uh, in securing this. I'm going to skip uh, over this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, and so that I can go to uh, and next click, please. Uh, to add to the opportunities. I think what we have not talked uh, so far is the importance of services sector. And here I would uh, want to mention two type of services. One is trade services that are actually all those essential services that um, allow us uh, transacting in domestic and across the border uh, transactions uh, smoothly, cheaply, and more efficiently. But also there is whole new world of uh, services trade that obviously we trade in different modes. Uh, it is very often intertwined with data flows, and this is known, known as, as mode one, uh, services services trade, but there are of course many others. Uh, however, because of this uh, sort of uh, overlapping of services trade, uh, those that are digitally enabled and data flows, we are now facing a really lack of regulation in terms of how to govern those nationally, regionally, uh, even within these new modern uh, regional agreements, we do not have strong uh, actual support in, in those regulations. And then of course we have conventional 
services uh, that we will need to reinvent uh, because of COVID. Uh, so these are, of course, tourism, uh, uh, education, health, uh, hospitality in, in, a, in a broader sense. Um, just very quickly, next slides. Uh, and I'm, I apologize for, for everyone because I'm skipping lots of stuff that I wanted to say about this. Um, the risk that, that I see in uh, us being able to deliver this better future for those that are expecting it uh, 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 really uh, uh, sort of in, in several baskets. One is in you know still very high level of uncertainty uh, that is caused by you know different different areas, uh, of course pandemic, but also global financial situation. Uh, trade protectionism that we can talk about and inflation, also um, you know tensions on geopolitical and of course wavering multilateralism because of the lack of trust. Um, the the positives, and I want to to end on a positive note, uh, is that uh, there is uh, some stronger uh, sort of signs of stronger confidence because uh, the vac vaccination uh, may be. Uh, produced in a larger number and hopefully distributed more efficiently. And then we, uh, the, the big hope comes from business actually doing uh, a, a revisiting of their role and changing their model of, of operation. And then hopefully also governments will be using all the lessons that have been, um, that will be extracted through these last uh, two years to learn from uh, from what what was happening and improve their own operation. Let me stop there and uh, apologies for um, for taking two two more uh, two minutes more than than I was allocated. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Dr. Mia. I think uh, good that uh, you you sort of break the enthusiasm and the positivity that came in the earlier part with the ground facts and say that uh, the global scenario and the Asian perspective is not as rosy as we would like to have in the future. That's good in terms of projections, but the reality on the ground. So we have to pull up our socks uh, and, uh, and, and gear ourselves for better in order to achieve the growth targets and so on. So that brings us to our final speaker. I won't say it's the last speaker, the final speaker, Dr. Giant Manon, and as I said, uh, he has his background to ADB, and now he is visiting senior fellow at the Yusuf Ishaq Institute Singapore, a very uh, enlightening uh, uh, think tank. Uh, Dr. Giant Manon, you take the floor now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Iqbal. And let me start also by thanking the organizers, KSI, for having me back again. Uh, now, as the sixth speaker, I guess a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, but let me try and make uh, three points in the time, uh, short time that I have. Uh, so the first point uh, relates to uh, the outlook. Um, so here I want to argue that Delta may dampen but not derail the economic recovery in Southeast Asia. Other speakers have also referred to this, so I'll be very brief. The second point is how we need to shift focus uh, from the short term to the long term now. And here I'm uh, referring to both the tangible uh, fallout from the pandemic, as well as the intangible, the rise in anti-globalization sentiments, as we've also heard some uh, speakers mention. Then finally, I want to talk about what I call the bias against the border, the anti-border bias. Uh, and we have to start thinking about opening borders safely right now, because it's already overdue if we are to uh, sustain our economic recoveries. Right, so let me start with the first point. Uh, so Delta will not derail economic recovery for three main reasons. The first is that this time around, unlike the first outbreak, uh, the response from governments have been less draconian. We haven't had the prolonged, complete lockdowns that we first saw uh, because we knew very little about this uh, new virus. 
This time around, they've been a lot more targeted um, and they haven't lasted as long as the first time. So that's the first point. And this is what affects the economy uh, more than anything else, the, the extent and the duration of government lockdowns. The second point is that we've learned how to adapt better to those measures that the government introduces. So firms have found better ways of uh, doing business. A lot of it has involved the digital uh, technologies that we have uh, now embraced. Uh, and um, if you look, for instance, at the Google mobility data uh, in Malaysia, uh, since we are now uh, in Malaysia, um, the first time around the lockdown reduced mobility in the retail sector by about 80%. But the recent uh, general lockdown, Malaysia was one of those countries that did bring in a general lockdown, mobility fell by only about 50%. So this is a very clear uh, indicator of how you know firms uh, and people have coped better with the restrictions and perhaps it might also explain why lockdowns are becoming less effective because of uh, uh, you know this adaptability and also the increased transmissibility of delta in particular so uh, these two uh, factors uh, suggest that you know we won't retest the bottom of the second quarter of 2022, but growth will be lower. For instance, we've heard Mia talk about the downgrading by all the multilaterals earlier. Um, ADB, for instance, had brought down Malaysia's growth rate for this year from 5.7 to 4.7. So most countries in this region uh, are going to have a lower growth than we expected, but not the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is still growing uh, quite strongly. Right. So the last point, of course, and we've heard a lot about this, is how stimulus is not only continued, but actually grown. So uh, all these factors suggest that growth will not be derailed, but it will be a little bit lower than we first thought before Delta came into the picture. So um, uh, this is also a reason why we need to look at the longer term factors. And I'm moving on now to my second point. So in terms of the longer term impacts, uh, the, the Delta pandemic, I think is raising a lot of uh, concerning trends, rises in un unemployment, poverty and inequality um, that will not go away anytime soon. Uh, the lack of progress with uh, the SDGs leading up to this pandemic has made the impacts of the pandemic even worse. And this is a vicious circle that we need to break somehow. Um, now, there are lots of intangibles also that are very worrying, and this is the rise in the anti-globalization forces. Uh, the pandemic, I think, has, is shifting this anti-globalization focus from the uh, distributional impacts of trade globalization, uh, unequal costs and benefits, to uh, factor mobility, right? The new uh, protectionists uh, are focusing their attention on capital and labor flows, especially cross borders. And so we found that there are new names also being used. Uh, for instance, we hear a lot about reshoring which is basically uh, reversing FDI flows. FDI flows is the lifeblood of globalization. Uh, resilience now has often come to mean pushing China or moving China out of supply chains. Uh, so these are the things we need to be concerned about. Uh, new protectionism comes in new disguises. Um, and uh, this is worrying. This is a worrying trend that we hope will arrested. Okay, now, uh, finally, let me move on to the last point, And uh, this is about uh, border closures. Uh, many countries in Asia, uh, when Delta, where Delta continues to rage, uh, are losing domestic restrictions because of the economy. But they are keeping borders firmly shut. And this is very much an Asian thing. Uh, 
partly because of the relatively lower vaccination rates, uh, but uh, I think there's also perhaps too much conservatism uh, playing in. Uh, but because borders uh, must remain uh, closed, apparently, the e economic imperative has required so much more domestic easing. Uh, and this has raised health risks more than they need to be raised. So if you cannot move on the border, then all your economic uh, imperative effects have to come from domestic easing. And domestic uh, easing is what's contributing to this massive uh, Delta spread, not the border. Uh, highly transmissible viruses like Delta reduce the value of border closures, uh, but the costs remain the same, right? So any strategy of managing rather than eliminating COVID must consider both domestic and border mobility restrictions, not one or the other as we have done so far. Uh, now, if Australia and New Zealand, who have almost completely shut their borders, cannot keep the new viruses out, then no one can do it. I think that's quite clear, and we are, we'd be foolish to think otherwise. Um, right, so I'm running out of time. So uh, let me try and conclude then by saying that uh, uh, the three points I wish to make is that the pandemic, uh, while it's peaking in this part of the region, will not derail the recovery, but it will dampen it. Uh, and um, the second point is that we need to shift our attention from fluctuations in growth rates to the longer term uh, rises in unemployment, poverty, and inequality that's reversing decades of progress. Uh, this should be our focus going forward. And in order to address those issues, we need to uh, push back on the rise in the anti-globalization forces. And one such pushback is to start thinking about how we can open borders safely. Uh, borders have been closed for too long in Asia compared to the rest of the world. Uh, vaccination rates are ramping up. So the planning to open borders must start now. And I think, uh, you know, Asia, this is uh, Asia century. I was involved in that project that, uh, uh, was mentioned uh, where I worked with a lot of my colleagues in uh, Washington, D.C., about uh, Asia 2050 being Asia century. Uh, but it will be Asia century if Asia is pragmatic rather than conservative. Asia has had conservative pragmatism uh, for a long time, but we need less conservatism and more pragmatism, especially at the border. And if we can do that, I think we'll have a much better outcome in terms of our recovery. Uh, with that, let me thank you for your attention and I thank you. look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayat Menon. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you, 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 you have concluded it quite well. And uh, if I have the liberty, I would say the organizers will say there is no more time left because you need to have a short recess or something before the next panel session. But there are certain burning questions that I have, which I want to address to the panel, but I don't think so there is going to be time for it. Maybe one question, uh, taking the cue from what Dr. Jayant Mannan has said, and earlier we have had certain uh, Manu Bhaskaran also has looked at it, and Andrew Weir also has uh, opened up the, the, the sort of a perspective, and that is, looking myopically within Asia, the Southeast Asia or the ASEAN. Now, the question is, uh, which countries among these, uh, which country or which countries among these have prepared themselves during this COVID, both in terms of containment and preparedness, and now attracting the FDI or other investments that are flowing in, in order to propel further. And then of course, they will package it together with the rest of the countries. And maybe I, I will ask uh, Manu Bhaskaran first uh, to, to comment on this. Uh, and then probably Andrew can come in and then we go back to Giant, Dr. Giant Manon, look at it. 
would you would you like to comment yes. on that? <clears throat> thank you yeah um yeah i i think uh, the good news is that some of the countries have continued to look at the long term and <clears throat> notice that in indonesia they brought in the omnibus uh, reform bills uh, in the middle of covid and it was a politically courageous thing to do and it was pulled off without too much resistance and we now see the enabling regulations come in as well and they are very much supportive of a pragmatic uh, implementation so i think um, <clears throat> indonesia's relative attractiveness uh, will improve of course things are not perfect uh, you know it takes time to bring about improvements but the cumulative impact of president jokowi's agenda of infrastructure reform cutting red tape and deregulation as well as uh, <clears throat> the labor market reform and um, the uh, I think so far successful policy of bringing in new industries like uh, uh, nickel smelting and electrical vehicles. These are all beginning to take shape and being noticed. And I think it's going to bring in foreign direct investment and the numbers back in. Vietnam is also, I think, doing very well. There's been some setbacks in the last two months because of the surge of COVID, but I think they're coming to grips with it. And I think despite some concerns, supply chains and so on, the fundamental attractiveness of Vietnam remains very much intact. So I pick on those two countries. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, uh, would you like to chip in and see if there is anything to add on? Uh, Andrew is now uh, out of picture. Uh, probably we'll go on to Dr. Giant Manon. Do you have anything to add on to this? Right. Uh, I think I agree with what Manuj has said. Let me add by talking again about uh, the countries that have uh, been trying harder than the rest in Southeast Asia to try and open borders. And I'm hoping that their efforts will lead to demonstration effects or a domino type effects where others will see the benefits of uh, changing this balance uh, from complete border closures uh, and free domestic easing to a more sort of uh, equitable one between the two. And here, I, I guess, uh, you know, Singapore has had uh, quite a practical approach uh, to this, they've opened up unilaterally uh, to several countries that have had low infection rates and um, uh, you know high vaccination rates, and it makes just good sense to do that. And uh, others often countries have reciprocated by also allowing two-way movement. Uh, so that's uh, something I think other countries need to do unilateral opening. We can't always expect travel bubbles to pop up. Um, and uh, reciprocity uh, may be something too much to ask for at the start. Uh, if it's in your interest, then do it, uh, and it often is. Uh, the other country, I guess, is Thailand that has tried um, to go forward. Uh, they have uh, a raging Delta outbreak, but they've gone through the micro herd immunity approach with the sandboxes, with Phuket and Koh Samui, and now looking to expand that further. That's one good way of doing it if you have a general outbreak. You isolate regions uh, where you reach micro herd immunity, and then you allow people to come in uh, and they spend their incubation period or qu without quarantine in those parts of the world, then they can move around after that. So those are the two countries I see as sort of leading the way in Southeast Asia. Remember the rest of the world is pretty much open, Europe and North America, has open borders, um, uh, but Asia is lagging, and hopefully these two countries will produce knock-on effects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mohammed, I just realized, sorry, my, I was having some technical issues. Yes, uh, yes, yes. And I heard my name being mentioned, and uh, I was trying to speak, and I couldn't even see myself. I do apologize. So not I at all, not at all. Um, I just like yeah, to, to, to reinforce uh, what, what the said said, because uh, I think Singapore and Thailand have have come out with a clear path. Yeah. Um, Hong Kong itself has a lack of a clear path. And in many ways, as an international global city, must be looking at ways to open up access um, to international visitors. But of course, has to also follow the effectively zero COVID model of mainland. And the lifeblood of Hong Kong in the view of Hong Kong government is the opening up of the mainland border. Um, and the risk that's seen in relation to that in Beijing is very significant. So I think Hong Kong is going to be quite a long run 
I think we're talking another at least another three months before we get a further look at it. And if I was a betting man, I would say it will be until after the Olympics, probably, but we're starting to see some form of opening up. So it's a worry. But going back to the original question, it's always a bit unfair to single out countries, particularly when we're doing a regional event and when also we are we are we are we are uh, really supporting across the region. I'll just go back to one of the points I said. I think the successful people obviously will be those all countries in the region are having national responses national investment plans, national infrastructure plans, national free zones or incentives. And it's linking that in to the regional initiatives on ASEP and TPP and others and the free trade agreements. The people who are able to do that well will be the winners in this. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for coming back to make that comments. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Subramaniam already there waiting to start off uh, with instructions from Zaim, the MC, and we are on the dot now, 11.30. I don't want to exceed, but I have a few questions already outlined. I will merely mention, particularly to Dr. Go, uh, when you look at China's track, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, and the sort of successes that they have had, not only on the containment of the COVID, but on their economic performance uh, under a single party system. Uh, although right or wrong, I think we are not going to debate on it, uh, but that is it. Then you have got the contrasting factor because earlier in my opening remarks, I mentioned about China and also about India as being the drivers within the Asian community. And uh, India, the largest democracy, uh, and then we have not comparable uh, sort of uh, statistics of performance. Uh, these are very uh, revealing kind of a situation. I, I, we don't want to discuss this, we don't have time, but I'm just leaving it for your thoughts. And maybe Tansri Michael and others uh, in KSI, we'll take up this to discuss. And we also have to look at within the Asia, I think this point is brought up earlier, this digitalization and looking forward in the economy, it is going to drive. And the vaccination is also a problem in Asia, not evenly distributed. Digital access is also constrained and then vaccination process is also constrained, you'll find that these are going to impact in some way as what uh, Dr. Mia did mention about the slacking that might be found. So with that, I'm extremely thankful to all our panelists. I don't want to mention by name, we don't have the time, but we give ourselves a, a big clap to all of you uh, for your successful and may I, hand over this to Zaim, the MC, to continue with the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you.